Oh, M&M's. Welcome to Easter. So glad you're with us. I need you to do me a favor. Those of us in the room here, would you help applaud and clap and scream as loud as you can and say welcome to all those sitting in overflow today. Give them a big clap. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Love y'all. And those of you on overflow, man, there's, there's a response at the end, and God's inviting you to himself. This is, this is going to be a day that's going to change your life. Stick with us today. We're so glad that you're with us. And I want to start this Easter with a question. Where do you find joy? Think about it. I'm going to ask for some participation. By the way, if this is your first time at 12 Stone, we're not known to be a quiet church. We're not known to be like a sit back and be quiet. You can be loud. You can respond. Uh, you can yell, go dogs, because go dogs always in the name of Jesus. Uh, and if you like Alabama, uh, there is an overflow section we'd like to get. Love y'all. So where do you find joy? Like typically there's a lane that if you're honest, like we're all different people, all individuals. We all have a wiring like one of four lanes just for today. Just sort of find yourself in the one. There's people that like the, the travel, the experiences lane. Then there's people who like, like the stuff or the hobbies lane. Then there's people like the food lane. And then people who like the relationship lane. So let me, let me walk through these. And when I get done, you tell me which one's yours. Maybe you're in the travel and the experiences lane. Like, where do you find joy? It might be like, man, put me in the mountains. Put me in a cabin. Send me to like an amusement park a sporting event, the beach, somebody, come on now, that's my wife, like, you put her on the beach, it's like the country's like, toes in the water, don't sing the next line, it's church, y'all, don't sing it, how many of y'all, that's you, you find joy in like, travel, experience, and hands up, you can say, woo, whatever, all right, here, overflow, let us know, where you at, all right, that's, that's some of you, some of you guys, it's like, you find joy in hobbies or stuff, like, you're, you, you, Love your car. There's a wife who's like, goodness gracious, does he love that car? Uh, you love your car, or maybe maybe you love like a new toy, a new thing, new clothes. Pickleball is like a thing. It's a weird name, but a lot of people, apparently a lot of people like it. For me, it's golf. Like, may put me off first off on the tee. No one in front of me. Do on the grass. I found my joy. My son Lincoln is Legos, like new stuff. How many of you, that's your lane? Like hobbies or like a new thing? Honest? Okay. Several of us there. All right. Uh, now, the third lane, I don't have to say much. How many of you is like just food? Like, goodness gracious, I find joy in food. Like a perfectly cooked steak or just chocolate of any sort, I'm down. Like, hands up again, if that's your lane, you find joy with the food. All right, that's, that's, that's honest. All right, how many of y'all, it's like relationships? Like you hang out with your boys or you, like the first date, you like, you get joy on that first date. His hand brushed against mine. Was that on purpose? I don't know. Maybe, it, well, I don't know. A butterfly, whatever. Or may, maybe like, this is one of my like, like an unexpected night with no sports for the kids, no school activities, nowhere to go, just sweatpants, Netflix, and order pizza. Anybody like it's people, it's hangouts, relationships. All right, where do you find joy? It's an interesting question, and this is, this is what's interesting as well, is that we're all unique individuals. Like some of y'all, like when you see people go nuts for food, you're like, whatever, food is fuel. That's all I care about. I'll go to the gym in the morning. Why do you love food like that? And some people are like, I would fight you for a Hershey's bar. That's okay. We're all individual people, and part of our calling as a church here at 12 Stone is we, we want to serve you as an individual. Like part of our calling is you're not just a sea of people, you're, you're you. And you got wiring and unique things about you, and we want to serve you well. So if you don't mind, everyone grab this card with me. When you get it in your hand, just wave it at me so I can see it. Some of y'all are cold already. You're like, stop waving, and I'm freezing. Some of y'all are grateful for it. Here, overflow, grab that card. And, and here's what I want you to hear. We're not just like a big church. We, we want to know you. It's like I would never say I have between two and five kids. I have three kids. I know each of them fairly well, I like to think. Luke, Lizzie, Lincoln. And we want to know you so we can serve you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually fill this card out together. Maybe you want to use the Bible because it's got a hard surface. That might be helpful so you don't know, poke through. And uh, we're going to turn the house lights up here. If you, if you guys can't overflow, turn the house lights up because I know some of y'all got some gray hair and you're about to get your iPhone out and flashlight that thing. We're going to turn the lights up for you because we love you. Go ahead and click those up. And then Richard, uh, can I get some card filling out music? That'd be helpful. Nope, not what I was looking for. Looking for more chill. Some of y'all had a spiritual experience. More of like a chill vibe. That's better. That feels right. We're going to start on that connection side together. 
and I'm going to do this with you. And some of you are like, really? Yeah, really. I asked my wife to fill it out. I asked our pastors to fill it out. Some of you were like, I'm not a card filling out person. I feel you because that's who I am. Humor me. Here's what we're going to do. Start at the top. This is my first time at 12 stone. I wouldn't check that. A bunch of you, that might be true. If that's you, check that box. Let us know. First name, Jason. You write your name, please. It's not funny if we got a thousand cards that have my name. Last name, Barry. Birth date, write it down. I accept Venmo. February 11th, 19, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about that. Married or single, I'll check married, and happily so. My wife's watching. I love you, babe. And if you're single as a Pringle, let us know. We got small groups with single people. Who knows? This Easter might be your year. Male, female, mobile number. I will not say mine out loud. I don't want to start having my phone blow up while I'm up here, but write yours down. Email address, your email address. Don't make up funny ones, although if we find some, I might read some, but please put your email on there. Your address. If there's an apartment, go ahead and do that. I don't know what this music is, bro, but it makes me want to talk like Hey, yeah, tip your weight staff. All right, your city, state, if you're in Georgia, that's GA. That was free. You learn something every day. Campus, we are at the Lawrenceville campus, but you fill out the one that you are at. And then if there's something we can pray for you about, and I don't say that lightly, we're going to pray over every request we get. Anything you write down, our staff's going to pray over that and ask just, God, would you, would you see and hear and respond to that? We're going to pray with you. And then the back side of the card, if you'll flip it, part of our calling here is we want to know how we can serve you. You don't exist to serve us. We exist to serve you. And then we invite your relationship with Jesus and you get to be a part of what God's doing here. And so we want to hear from you. Like if there's a, something you want us to talk about, what the Bible says about something, there's a list there. Addiction, basic Christianity, culture, finances. Like if you'll check a box or two, let us know. And there's also a blank. You can like write something in that we don't have listed. Check that. And then in August, we're going to do a series, four weeks, based on the results of what you guys asked for. And we're going to teach four weeks directly connected to this. So let us know what would be helpful in serving you in your spiritual journey. And we'll do that. And then at the bottom, I would really like to fill in the blank. Our heart here is that if there's some way we can help you take your next step of faith, we're not just a once a year church. We're an everyday church. And I'm so glad that you're with us. And if there's a way, whether it's a group or signing up for growth track or your next step or just, you don't know what you want, but help me. I want to talk to somebody. Check that last box. And then at the bottom, you see A, B, C, D. Leave that blank for now. We're going to come back to that at the end of the service. And thank you so much. Can you give yourselves a round of applause? You filled out the card so far. Well done. We made it all the way to hear. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to invite us into the story of Easter because we ask the question, what brings you joy? That's a real question. And the story of Easter points us to joy. And I pray by the end of today, you would understand why Easter points us to joy. But before we really can understand why Easter is joyful for us, I want you to understand the joy of God. Where does God get joy? And Hebrews 12, verse 2, this is, you may have never heard this before, but Easter brought God joy. And if you know the story of Easter, it's a, it's, a, it's a weighty story that God sent his son Jesus. Jesus lived the life we could not live, never sinned perfect. Jesus voluntarily laid his life down on the cross, taking the punishment we deserve. And then three days later, Easter morning, he rose from the dead. The tomb is empty, and we hear the story and know the end, but there's a weight to the journey to the joy of Easter. And this is what gives God joy. Here's what it says in verse 2 of Hebrews 12. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy. Somebody say joy like you mean it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. If you hear nothing else I say on this Easter, hear this. The joy set before Jesus was the idea that what he was about to, to conquer on the cross was going to free you up to have a relationship with God again. And it was the joy of you being valuable enough, his love for you, that helped him endure the cross so that you would have an opportunity to know Jesus. And before we leave today, I hope that you will experience not just the fact that God gets joy in redeeming and restoring and forgiving you, but there is joy that we can discover as well. And so I asked Cameron and the guys, I said, man, would you, 
would you help set the table for the story of Easter? Because there is a joy, but there's also a weight. There's a depth to it. And I asked, I said, man, there's an old hymn called, Were You There? And this, this hymn sort of walks us through the stations of Easter, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And so I want to I invite you into this moment here in Overflow across the campuses online. And just allow this to sort of settle your heart into the story of Easter. Worship well.
That is the story of Easter. And the, the, the complexity of the story of Easter is that we know the ending already. And we live in the victory that Jesus conquered over sin and over death. But I need you to get back to the first Easter. Think about the reality of the people experiencing the first Easter that they don't know the end of the movie yet. Where, where, where they, they watched and they walked with Jesus for three years of his earthly ministry and all the claims he made. I'm the son of God. Came to seek and to save the lost. I'm here to do it. And then they watch on Good Friday as he's nailed to a cross and he's, he lays his life down. He dies. And then they put him in a tomb and they roll the stone in front of it like the story of Easter has no joy in that moment. And then on Easter morning, the ladies wake up and they head to the tomb. And I want you to see the story of Easter as it plays out. So the women go to the tomb. They find it empty. Jesus is risen. And they hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. Somebody say joy. Filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples what happened. They found joy on Easter morning because the tomb was empty. The claims Jesus made were true. He wasn't a fairy tale. He didn't make it up. He wasn't a crazy person. What he said was true. And they found joy on Easter. And maybe today you will as well. It's our heart for you is that you would find the joy of Easter. Because sometimes joy shows up where you least expect it. For them, it was in like a cemetery. Not a lot of joy in cemeteries. That's, if you find joy in a cemetery, I got a psychologist I'd like to sit down with and help you understand some things. Not a lot of times you find joy in a cemetery. They found joy. Some unexpected places, then equally, joy is also, sometimes it shows up in, like you expect it to show up in some places, and it doesn't. Like, it, places that you're like, this should be joyful. My wife grew up going to Six Flags. She's here from the Atlanta area. Her childhood memory is full of joy. Then several years ago, we took the kids to Six Flags, trying to recapture the joy she had, and like half the rides were broke. <laughs> Stuff needed paint everywhere. Like it wasn't what she remembered. She expected joy and it didn't play out like she thought. Here's, here's maybe a more honest question on this Easter. Where did you hope to find joy but didn't? Be honest. There's places where you expect it. You hope to find joy but, but you didn't experience it there. Like the car that you thought, if I just get this. The job you finally land and you think this is what's missing. Like you're single and you're like, when I finally meet that man, then you meet that man. And have you met men? Uh, it, you did not the joy you hoped. Don't, don't elbow the guy next to you. It's Easter. <laughs> he is risen indeed. Come on now. Let's just, can we just be honest? Like one of the things I, I, I dislike about modern church is we're supposed to fake this stuff. Everything's fine. Every, I've got joy. Everything's happy. Everything works all the time, and we put on our pastel colors for Easter, and everything's fine, when the reality is sometimes the places we expect to find joy, the places we expect to deliver on joy, they leave us not with joy. In fact, let me say it this way. The opposite of joy is actually not sadness. It's emptiness. Like, the opposite of happiness is sadness, but the opposite of joy is emptiness. Like, you know, you can have moments of happiness and have a smile on your face, but still be empty inside. Like, there's people that walk around every day with a big old smile, and what you don't know is there's a quiet emptiness. And we all walk through our life in search of a joy that won't leave us empty anymore. And if you're not honest about that, you're lying to yourself. I'm in that camp. I've been in that camp before. Maybe you're in that camp today. In fact, I want to play this out because in our pursuit of a joy that won't leave us empty, we, we make trades all the time trying to get it. And sometimes it leads us to places of emptiness and regret. You might find yourself somewhere in this thought. Like sometimes we end up overworking, trying to earn and get the promotion and get the raise and get the next thing. And if I finally get to this position or this level of, of success or my business finally gets to this place or that place or my bank account finally gets to this place or that place, it'll give me joy. And then you wake up and you're still empty, trading time with your family, with your kids. And you go, it didn't deliver like I thought. 
thought it would deliver. In fact, stats from today, maybe 40, 50 percent of first marriages and 67 percent of second marriages end in divorce. We end up trading things and we don't spend time in the marriage investing in the family. We wake up and we got the position and we're still empty and we traded something that was more valuable. Let's just be honest about this stuff. This one, this one's free of charge. The only people that will remember you worked overtime in 20 years, go 20 years from now, who's going to remember your kids, not your boss and not the company you work for. Don't pretend we make trays looking to fill the empty. Sometimes we end up overeating, over drinking, over consuming, and we, we trade our health and our wisdom and we, we trade our future. We just try to eat our way to not empty anymore or drink our way, or we try to numb ourselves to get through it, and we left with regret and empty. It, it might be why nearly a third of our adult population has some issue with substance abuse, prescription meds, alcohol. Man, like we're, we're, we're in a search for a joy that won't leave us empty again. We end up overspending and trading our, our money and our future to try to buy something. Man, if I could get the the boat on Lanier changed my life. It'd be amazing. Then you get it and you realize boats are really expensive and always break down. You're like, I'm still empty again. I got the car. I got the house. I got the thing. And for a minute, it's like, oh, it's great. And then you're empty again. It, it might be why 36% of our adult population has more consumer credit card debt than they do an emergency fund. And I'm not indicting. This is not like a how dare you. It's a, this is indicative of a culture who's looking for a joy that will not leave us empty again. Like some of us, we, we, we want the joy of a relationship so bad that we, that we cross lines of our character and our morality and we, we degrade the beauty of who we are. Like the, you, you go on dates and you get to a place where like, I want this guy to stick around. I want this girl to stick around. And you cross lines that you might not even be a believer yet, but at a soul level baked into you, you know that there is a value to your body. And you cross lines and give things away you can't get back. And the next morning you wake up and you go, I'm just as empty as I started. You might have even done the thing that seems right. You might have even played around with religion. Checking boxes, going to church, doing things. But it's leaving you like with an emptiness still because you don't actually walk with God. You don't know God. You just do religious stuff. And it, it might be why some 40% of U.S. adults report struggling in some way with anxiety and depression. So there's an epidemic, people searching for things that won't leave them empty again. Here's a quote that I think is just haunting. It's hard to get enough of something that almost works. Let that just sort of wash over here, wash over the overflow. It's hard to get enough of something that almost works. You know the problem with the list I just read? All those things almost work. Gosh, if I just get this much money in my bank account, I'll have a freedom I didn't have before. I won't have the every month, how am I going to make rent or make a mortgage? And then you get it, and you're like, it almost worked. Gosh, if I could just get married, and then you get married, it almost works. Fulfills and brings a joy for a moment, but it doesn't last. And I wonder, I wonder if we have to have an honest conversation this Easter and just consider, maybe we don't know how to measure the things that are worth trading our life away for. Like, I wonder if the things we believe is that that'll bring me joy. And that'll, maybe we're not the best pickers. Maybe we, maybe, can we just be honest? Sometimes the things we're doing just aren't working. Don't make this a church conversation. Don't make this churchy. This is not like, and th thus saith, the, like, it's just a human experience. And everybody you meet, if they've not settled the emptiness, are looking for ways to settle it. And what if God brought you here today to help? Invite you into a conversation about the empty because listen, there is a quiet emptiness that few people talk about, but most people live with. All right, let's pray and go home. Happy Easter. In fact, look at your neighbor. Say, I thought this was supposed to be joyful today. <laughs> Actually, remind them. Say, hey, we're about to get to the joy part. Tell them we're about to get to the joy part. See, we have to find ourselves in the empty so that we can enjoy and experience the joyful side of this. And in order to unpack this thought, like where do you find joy that won't leave you empty? We're going to step into a story that Jesus told. 
In order to understand the story, I need to unpack the historical context because this story is going to unpack the trade that God invites you to make for something that's worth more than you could imagine, a treasure that will return not empty but full of joy over and over and over again. So to understand it, here's the history. So back in Jesus' day some 2,000 years ago, they didn't have banks or vaults, or safes, or online banking, you could put your valuables to protect them. And so what would happen is, when you had something valuable, you'd go find a spot out in a field somewhere no one was around, you'd dig a hole, crazy enough, you'd dig a hole, stick your treasure in there, cover it back up, put some sticks and foliage on it so no one would know the difference, only you know where it's buried, because what would happen is other nations would come in and invade, and they'd take some of your land, and you'd fight them back off again, and you'd bury your treasure, and then when you came back to your land, you'd go dig it back up again and retrieve it, and it's safe, and it was safekeeping. The problem is not everybody came back and was able to come back and get their treasure. So you'd bury it, you'd be pushed off, and sometimes you were pushed out of your land for so long you died and never got to come back and get it. And so in Jesus' time, go with me, everybody was sort of like an amateur treasure hunter because you never know where treasure, like any spot you're standing could have treasure on it. So people would always sort of have an eye out for like, I wonder if this is a spot or that's a spot. This could be treasure. That could be treasure. And so the, 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 the thing you have to understand is whoever owns the land owns the treasure buried on it, even if it's not discovered yet. And so back then there was this pursuit of a treasure. Just so you know, they were looking for a treasure that would bring them joy back then, too. So here's the parable Jesus told. Follow with me. The kingdom of heaven is like, when Jesus says that, you should perk up. Because he's helping you understand something we won't understand naturally. There's a kingdom of God. There's a way that God thinks and God sees that when Jesus said that, he's letting you in. This is like your best friend whispering a secret, like, hey, you need to know this. Jesus is saying, this is what God's like. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. And now you understand why it was hidden in a field. We just explained it. But when a man found it, found the treasure, he hid it again. And then in his joy, somebody say joy, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. This is a simple, like Jesus in two lines can say more than I can say in two hours. It's amazing. This parable has some things we have to understand because there was, there was some components to this, a journey of joy in this story that I want us to see. Here's the first. The man found the treasure and he recognized its value. And in this story, we're like the man who just stumbled upon treasure. See, what, what happened here was the man didn't earn that treasure. He didn't work for it. He's not the one who buried it. He didn't make a bunch of good business decisions that amassed a treasure, and he's just going to get his treasure back. He stumbled upon a treasure he had nothing to do with. He just found it. And when he did find it, he, he recognized the value of it. He could have stumbled upon treasure and be like, oh, that's some gold. Cool. And moved on with his life. But he, he found the treasure, and he recognized that it had great value on top of that. And I always play out stories like this and think, how many people walked across that same piece of land and never realized treasure was like just beneath the surface? Like this might have been like a, on his way to work and he walked past that treasure over and over again, never realizing it was right there underneath the surface. You, you can be at Easter year after year and walk right past the treasure and not even know it's there until you can't miss it anymore. And so this man stumbles upon this treasure and the treasure was not his until he bought the land. And so what did he do next? The man joyfully traded everything he owned to buy the field to get the treasure. And I don't want you to miss this because, listen, no one forced him to sell his stuff. No one guilted him into it. No one grabbed his arm and drug him to Facebook Marketplace and said, list all your junk and sell it. He joyfully did it. Grandma wasn't sitting down the row side-eyeing him saying, sell your treasure. Listen, you, you, you might have grown up in a world by which you see God and you see faith and you see churches like some coercive, manipulative, twist-your-arm, guilt-trip you into something sort of thing. Like Grandma might have told you, if you don't go forward on Easter, you're not getting any of my casserole. You're like, well, casserole, I'll go forward for casserole, right? 
I don't know what your view is, but, but Jesus is saying the kingdom of, of heaven, my father's kingdom is not like that. It's like a man who discovers a treasure and joyfully sells everything he owns. And imagine being one of his friends watching him do this. Like, are you losing your mind? Because he couldn't have told anybody if they heard about the treasure, the man who owned the field would take the treasure from him. So he had to keep it quiet, sells everything. His friends are like, what are you doing, bro? Where are you going to sleep? Don't care. Sell my bed. It's a, it's a fire sale. Everything must go. My shoes, all yours. Take them all. Sell everything. And when he sold it all, he went and bought that field. But he did it in his joy. See, when I recognize that my wife, Amber, I'm dating my wife now, but she's not my wife then, my girlfriend, I'm dating Amber. When I recognize the treasure that she was, and by the way, I recognize the treasure that she was because I had dated other girls who were not treasures. And so I know, no offense, some of y'all, not treasures. So um, in God's eyes, you are, you are hundred percent. God loves you, but not a right fit for my heart. Anyway, I knew what a treasure was because I figured out what a treasure wasn't. And as soon as I recognized that my wife was a treasure, I joyfully didn't play golf as often, didn't go out to eat as often, saved up money to buy a ring. And when I got that ring, it was burning a hole in my pocket. I could not wait. There'd be moments I'd be like, nope, don't do it yet. Not yet. Don't do it. Hold on. Like I wanted it because like the joy, when you recognize that there's a treasure in your joy, you gladly, joyfully trade for it. And why do I say this on Easter? Say it straight. Jesus is the treasure. That's the story of Easter, that Jesus is that treasure. Jesus is the treasure. Why? Again, I want to just, I want to bottom shelf this. I'm not even pretending that y'all know the Bible or understand any part of the story. Let, just bear with me. You might know more than I do. Let me just say it plainly. Why is Jesus the treasure? Because nothing else we have tried has produced true joy, just more emptiness. Don't you get tired? Being empty, I buy the thing and I'm happy for a minute, empty the next day. I cross this line and I know, gosh, this gets me through the night, but the next, I'm empty. The promotion, the stuff, the accolades, the job, the thing, and it leaves you empty because we're trying to solve a problem in here with stuff out there. And the problem isn't out there, the problem's in here. Jesus is the treasure because he was sent by God to solve the problem in here. And the joy that we talk about on Easter is not a joy that's predicated on circumstances. It's a joy that is everlasting. And the issue's not out there. It's in here. And the second reason Jesus is the treasure, because our emptiness is a result of sin. You're like, that's the first time you've said that word. It is. Let me explain. What is sin? Sin is any way that we look to fix what's broke in here with stuff out there. There's things that God was designed to solve in your life, and we spend our life trying to solve a God-shaped emptiness with other things, and we end up crossing lines, and we're in greed and selfishness, and we lie to get ahead, and we take advantage of people. Find yourself in the list. Don't raise a hand, but we're all on the list. We violate things of God's truth, looking for something to fill us up. And the truth is this, that Jesus came to live the life we could not live, die the death on the cross we deserved, and raise to life to win the victory we could not win. And I want you to hear this. We're out here making trades, trying to find a joy that will not leave us empty. And Jesus went first and made a trade on Easter. I want you to see this trade. Here's how it says it. That God made him, God made Jesus, who had no sin, he lived perfect, to be sin, trade one, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God, trade two. I want you to catch this. We are sinners. We are broken. There's stuff inside we cannot solve. There's emptiness that we try to solve with stuff and people and relationships, and we can't. And Jesus stepped in and said, I'll take all your sin, and I will trade you my righteousness. And I will take the punishment that you deserve. You trade me that, and I'll give you the reward that I deserve. Jesus went first. He made the trade before we ever even considered making the trade. And Jesus said, listen, I'll trade your emptiness for my joy. I'll trade your shame and guilt and the past that still haunts you 
for my future and my eternity. I'll trade your sin for my righteousness, says Jesus. So Easter starts with the trade he made, but it's not enough. It's not complete until we invite you into the trade that God makes, invites you to make. Here's what our trade looks like, Matthew 16. Jesus talking to his disciples, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must say no to themselves. Start here. How do we get in this mess? Say yes to ourselves all the time. That'll fill me up. That'll fill me up. Let's start here. Deny yourself and then pick up their cross. They have to follow me, Jesus says. Jesus said, I died on the cross and now I traded your sin for my righteousness. Now you pick up your cross and carry it. Every day you're living with a recognition of what Jesus did. And then whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But here's our trade. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. The trade of God, my life for you. All of me for all of you. The offer of salvation is not one that you try out or play around with. The man in the story did not just sell his old clothes and his used car and his bad set of golf clubs. He sold everything. He didn't just go half in. He sold everything to purchase the field. And if, if you've never said yes to Jesus, this feels like a steep ask. This trade feels heavy because you, you have got to settle what is treasure that is worth trading everything for. And I wish I could tell you that God would be like, listen, if you just sort of give me a wink and a thumbs up, you're good. But he's like, no, it's all of you for all of me. This is not a light, easy trade. So I want to just unpack this for two groups. So when you realize there's an emptiness and a sin and a separation that you cannot solve. And if you live long enough, you could, you could agree with me. There's nothing out there that will solve the emptiness in here. You will either see something or you won't see something. I want to talk first for those. You, you hear me talk. You may have heard this a hundred times. This might be your first time. You might have grown up in church. This might be your first time in church. But you, you hear me talk about Jesus as the treasure, and you go, I, I don't see the treasure in all of this yet. It sounds great, good for you, but I don't see the treasure in it. Can I free you up? The trade makes no sense if you don't see the treasure. And I want to be the first one to admit it. I can be, this can be an honest conversation. I'm not playing church. Like, if you don't see Jesus as a treasure, this trade makes absolutely no sense. And the Spirit of God has not awakened you to the treasure yet. You might walk past it another Easter and it's buried right there and you missed it. But can I invite you? Would you stick around, man? Like, part of why we exist so we can keep reminding you the treasure that Jesus is. And one day the Spirit of God just awakens you to it. But there's another group that God has helped you today see that the treasure of Jesus is worth trading everything for. And if that's you, when you find a treasure worth trading for, you do it joyfully. And today is not going to be an emotionally coercive moment. It's not going to be a guilt trip. I don't care if your grandma's side on you down the road. That's not what today is. This is, let me, can I just explain how it works? When the spirit of God awakens you to the treasure, it's like a light switch goes on. Listen here, overflow, listen to me. You might be sitting here and you might have been in church your whole life or today's the first day. You might know the facts of the Easter story and be able to regurgitate. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, but it never was a treasure until the Spirit of God just went, and you go, oh my goodness, it's a treasure. And when you experience that, when you see the treasure, no one has to guilt you into trading for it. And so I'm not even going to try to do that. If it's not valuable and not treasure, chill out. Knock yourself out. But for many among us, it's like a light switch in your soul turned on. You go, Jesus is the treasure. And the things that once felt foolish or fairy tales or an empty religion or a guilt trip to control your behavior now looks like a treasure worth trading for. So all I want to do is tell you, how do you make that trade? And it might look like a prayer or something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I recognize that Jesus is the treasure. And I joyfully trade everything else to accept him as my savior. 
Please forgive me for my sin. Fill my emptiness with your joy and help me to live for you in Jesus' name, amen. And that prayer is not magic words. It's not like a magic spell. If you say it out loud, God's like, you said the right words. It's a, it's a posture of your heart where you're saying, Jesus, just like the man in the story, I sell and trade and exchange anything in this world for all of you. My sin, my past, my priorities, my values, I lay it all down and say, Jesus, you are the treasure worth trading for. If that's you, we're going to have a response moment in a minute, but I want all of us to do this. Grab that card one more time. We're going to end today by taking what I'm going to call a spiritual survey. We're looking at A, B, C, D at the bottom. Everybody do this, man. I asked my wife to do it, staff to do it. If you, if you want to make me feel better, just fake it. Be like, no pen. I don't care. But just can we, can we play along? Because everybody will find themselves in one of these four categories. Everybody. And I hope you feel this from us. I want you to be honest, sincere. Don't, this is not an aspirational box check. This is a current moment. Where am I? And so get your pens out, and you're going to check one of these four boxes, please. And here's what they, they mean. A. I already know God personally. This is those of us who have already said, Jesus, I see you as the treasure. I bow my life to you. I surrender my life. I follow you. You're a Christian. Pick the terminology you use, but you know that you walk with God. If that's you, check that box and just pause this Easter and whisper under your breath, Jesus, you're still the treasure. Not just years ago, decades ago, when I made that decision and I bowed my life, Jesus, you're still the treasure. Today, you're the treasure. Tomorrow, you're the treasure. It never gets old. Many among us have already done this. Check that box A. There's another group B. I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus today. And this is the group that would respond to what I just said, where you're going, I finally see the treasure of Jesus and I will trade for it. All my sin for his righteousness, all my past for his future, all my emptiness for his joy. I'm in. He can have all of me. You check that box B and we're going to offer this prayer again in a minute. We're going to read it out loud and it's going to be your moment of surrender. But I love these next two. There's a third group. C, I want to consider it a bit more first. You're here this Easter and you're like, I'm starting to understand it. I'm starting to see it, but I just need a little time. I love that. Be honest and tell us. Hang out with us. Be around here. The Spirit of God is drawing you to himself. And I believe that there's an emptiness that you'll never feel unless you meet Jesus. So I, I want you to be here when you come to that realization so we can serve you in that. Then the last group. I don't ever intend on making that decision. And can I be honest? I have like a ton of respect for people who have the courage to check that box. Like just be honest. Someone drug you here today. You have no interest in this and you have no desire. Check D and check it with boldness, man. I respect that. And we're not going to stalk you down. We're not going to send you letters. We're not going to show up at your house. We have your address. We're going to show up. Hey, you check the box D. I'm here to change it. No. We're going to do one thing, and it's going to tick you off. We are going to pray for you. And we're going to pray for you consistently because I believe there'll be years in the future where someone writes on the bottom of their card, I checked the the box D two years ago, and today I'm checking B. Because there's a God who loves you and is pursuing you. So check the boxes, and then here's what we're going to do. I want all of us across the campus in overflow Just stand up and keep your card in your hand. And in just a minute, all of us are going to put these cards in the baskets when they pass. But I want to talk to group B. Let's all stand together. Stretch those legs out here. Overflow. And they're going to put that prayer back up on the screen. And we're going to read this prayer out loud, all of us. And for many of us, we've already offered this prayer. We've already laid our life down. But for numbers of you in this room and across Overflow and online at the campuses, this is your moment saying, Jesus, I see you as the treasure. I trade all of me for all of you. This is what we're going to do. We're going to read it out loud together. And for many of you, this is your moment of surrender. So loud and proud, everybody reads it. Dear Heavenly Father, I recognize that Jesus is the treasure. And I joyfully trade everything else to accept him as my savior. Please forgive me for my sin. Fill my emptiness with your joy and help me to live for you. In Jesus name, amen. Now, if you offered that prayer, 
I'm going to invite you into a courageous moment, a sacred moment. Here's what we're going to do. Everyone else put this in the basket when it goes by, but if you check B, first of all, the best decision you ever make. But I want to invite you into something courageous. You're going to take your card, and instead of putting it in the basket, you're going to make your way to the front. You're going to drop your card here on the stage and just say, all of me for all of you, Jesus. Sacred moment of surrender. There's a sense that when you see the treasure, this is like a sort of symbolic of the trade. You're saying, Jesus, I trade me for you. And when you do that, we're going to clap and we're going to celebrate like all of heaven does. And I, I, I like the weight of this moment because it requires something of courage in you. And that man, no one had to tell him, make the trade. He saw the treasure, he's in. There's people in this room in an overflow, you're foaming at the mouth. I'm like, I'm in. So as I begin to talk right now, you begin to make your way. If you're in overflow, we're going to open the side doors, Cornerstone Cafe, you can make your way in. It takes courage to come down. I said, man. Praise the Lord. You begin to make your way down. All of you for all of him. We celebrate a Savior who still saves. Grown men, fathers, lead the way for your family. Overflow, come on. The doors are open. You can make your way here. This is not casual. Here's what we're going to do. The band's going to begin to lead us. You, you continue to come and you trade all of you for all of him. You offer the prayer, Jesus, forgive me my sins and fill me with your joy. And church, what do all of us do? Come on now. That's how you do it. When one steps in the kingdom, what do all of us do? We celebrate. Worship well. King Jesus. Happy Easter. Worship well.
so church, one more time, what does all of heaven do when even one comes into the kingdom of God? We celebrate, that's what heaven's doing, that's what we do, man, it's a special, special thing. Woo, y'all can have a seat, thank you so much, man, what a moment, what a moment. For those of you that check B, first of all, congratulations, like Jason said, it's a decision that's gonna change your life. We're so proud of you. Such a courageous move. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for making it up here. Listen, if you, if you have your card, you selected B, but you didn't make it up to the stage, maybe you're a little hesitant, maybe you're a little scared, that's okay. We're about to receive the offering. You can put it in the offering basket or you can bring it right up to us, right after the service. We've got a prayer team. We would love to talk to you and pray for you. We would love to do that. But congratulations. Best day of your life hands down. Now listen, as we get ready to receive the offering for the rest of us, we still have our cards, right? We're going to use those right now as the offering basket passes. You can just slip it right in there. And so uh, just to let you know, to some family, this is an opportunity for you. You know how to do this. If you're a guest with us, like no obligation to, to give anything, just let the baskets pass, but we'd love that card. So Daymakers, you can go ahead and receive the offering at this time. And as we do, I wanna give you a little bit of a heads up on what's coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, last week, our founding pastor, Kevin Myers, started a conversation with us on faithfulness. He's gonna finish that conversation next week. And then in two weeks, we're starting a brand new series of conversations talking about how to follow Jesus in a complex world. Like, it's complex out there, y'all. <laughs> and so we wanted to show you a little bit more about what you can expect in two weeks. Check it out. Oh, oh, man. When I was growing up, this was my playground, the arcade. Remember these? The lights and the sounds and the sticky floors and the smell of adolescent aggression. It was basically just B.O. <laughs> it was a heaven. And then in Christmas of 1988, it happened. I received my very own Nintendo Entertainment System, right? You remember the first time you got your first console? It was like the kindness of God dropped right into the middle of your living room. It was heaven. In fact, look at this controller. It's so simple. Every single game is basically just running from left to right and pressing one of two buttons to either save a princess or kill an alien or something like that. It was simple and I loved it. And then I started to grow up and things seemed to get more complicated, right? You fall in love and get married. You got culture and politics and social media and then parenting. Heck, even video games themselves got more complicated. Take a look at this. This is the PlayStation 5 controller. I don't know if you can see it, but it has more buttons than I have fingers. Literally, it's so complicated. And it started me asking the question, if I was raised in a world like this, how do I live in a world like this? How do I teach my kids to live in a world like this? So that's what we're gonna dive into starting April 14th. We're gonna start answering questions like, how do I live wise? How do I love my neighbor and raise kids? How do I stand for God and truth in a complex world that needs more than simplistic answers? It's gonna be an awesome series. It's gonna be a game changer of a series. Bad pun, I had to, I'm sorry. in two weeks. You're going to want to be a part of that. It's going to be a marking series. And uh, guys, if, if you felt God moving in your life today, I don't care if you checked A, B, C, or D. If there's something that God is doing in you, come talk to us about it. we got a prayer team. We'd love to pray for you and over you and do that. Now, here's the last thing. You know how we talked about joy today? I want you to remember that joy in the parking lot, okay? Because it's going to take a second, all right? So like, have some joy in the parking lot as you leave. We love y'all for God is good. And all the time, God is good. Happy Easter. Man, what a day. Yeah, that was <laughs> great. Oh, I got you. I got that, you. That's a weird. Yeah. Hey, online. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today. And um, you saw God move in the room with yeah. the cards. And um, hey, you can respond as well. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone had physical cards here. You might have seen earlier, you can text SURVEY to 37748, right. Right. and you can fill out the same survey. And if you mark B, if you yes. mark B, we'll give you a call, and we'd love to have that conversation with right. you about what God's doing in your life. Yeah, so let me talk to those of you who marked C on that card. And um, listen, 
keep going. Maybe you're just investigating Christianity. You're curious yep. about what it means to follow Jesus. Listen, the life that Jesus offers you is far greater than the life you're living. So Amen. just keep going. Come back next yeah, week good. and hear Kevin. And yeah, then come next week. the next series. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And then, here's the thing too. If you're with some people, uh, maybe you're on spring, spring break. break. First of all, we're jealous. Yeah. Oh man, if I could see where you guys mountains are at right or now. Mountains or beach? Uh, beach for sure. Oh, mountains. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. All right. Oh. Uh, have have a couple of questions, and uh, David, those questions are. Yeah. Um, what's your main takeaway from the teaching? A lot of incredible things, like yeah. treasure. Well, anyway, what what did God Pick say one. to you specifically? Just one. And what's your next step this week? By God's grace and the power of the gospel, how are you going to take that step this week to? actually do something with yeah, it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And if you're still listening, you're probably wondering what Dave and I are doing for Easter. Well, what are you doing? Yeah, I am going to have lunch on the town green okay. in downtown Duluth, which is here in North Georgia. Nice. It's, it's my neighborhood. So if so. you want to see David, come, come to on, Duluth. Come on, you're, you're welcome. Plenty of ham. Yeah, there'll be plenty of ham. <laughs> yeah. I am, uh, I'm doing another Easter egg hunt today. <laughs> this is our third Easter egg hunt. I'm not even I kidding I wish you. I still had young kids. Sayla loves it. And then we're going to eat ham as well. Oh, is that you what go. you do on Easter? You it's eat ham? absolutely what Hey, whatever you you're having, enjoy it. We'll yeah, see you next yeah. week. Hey, bye. Love you guys.